if you'd like to join the classes live in the masjid then click on the link below inshallah it will take you to a telegram group that has the details of all the class timings the dates the days the addresses and the locations of the masjid so click on that link and hopefully we'll see you there inshallah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah maban brothers knowledge is jihad i keep it real with you man i know it's not easy but it's jihad and when you're in jannah inshallah you're gonna be like i made it alhamdulillah we're studying tahara, right? We're studying tahara, how to purify yourself because you need to have tahara in order to pray your salah, okay? We only have three more lessons on tahara. This lesson, next week's lesson is going to be upon the menses when a woman is on her period and whatnot and so on and so forth and it's very important for brothers because when you get married, you don't want to come and be asking, Yo, what, what's, what's this coming out of my wife? What, did you, what, do you do? what, did you, what happens? It's kind of, you know what I'm saying? And if you don't know, you should ask. But it's an uncomfortable conversation. So it's best that you just know. And then the third thing is what? We're going to talk about najasa, how to purify things that become impure. So we'll talk about that, inshallah. Three, and then three lessons after we are on Kitab al Salah. Does that make sense? So today we're going to go through Tayammum. I just want to mention something. By the end of the year, and when I say end of the year, I mean August, because we started in August last year, we're going to hopefully have finished this whole fiqh series. Anyone, and I've been saying this, I'm just saying it again, inshallah ta'ala, who makes it to the end of the class and who consistently turns up. I understand people miss classes here and there, but consistently turn up. We're doing, a, we're doing a big trip to Dubai, inshallah. In the sun, in the beach. Uh, I can't take the sisters, sorry. <laughs> They're going to have to ask your mahab to take you. But for the brothers, we're going to do that. We're going to go quad biking. We're going to go snorkeling. I've got Reggie who's got a boat. He's going to take us, there's, there's something called Moon Island. It's an island that is in the shape of a moon crescent. We're going to snorkel there. He's got a sharpshooter. Bang! Shoot fishes. Come eat it. A couple sharks. But they're not going to do anything to you. One of my friends was, 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 I was you, know, you, you guys know Sheikh Tim Humble? He does this a lot. He's a, he's a, snor he's a, he's a snorkeler. So one time we went snorkeling. He took us. And he goes, um... Oh, there's a shark! And it was me, and I don't know if you guys know, there's a brother called Guled. And he was in front of me, and I was right at the back. So I, when he got excited when he saw the shark. I said to myself, blood, I ain't the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, you know me, I'm from Pakistan. You know, we're scared of sharks. <laughs> and then Guled, I don't know what, man. Because usually Somalis, they don't do this thing, right? But he was like, what? And he swam towards the shark. And he's looking up, yo, there's a shark. So me, I'm there like, I have to, I can't pretend like I'm scared. I'm not, like, I'm at the back. I'm like, really? Okay, I'm coming. Hold the shark for me. <laughs> and I'm even mad slow. He goes, oh, you missed it. The shark's gone. I'm like, alhamdulillah. <laughs> it's funny. I'll just tell you as a side point, inshallah ta'ala. As we were driving, yeah? As we were driving to this place, it's got beautiful water. Like the water is that see through. You can see the fish in the water. When they're standing on top. And um, I was there. I started class two, three seconds, two, three minutes, but it's a little break and to inspire you guys. Because I, I really want to go snorkeling with all of you. I want to take you all. It's important that, you know, brothers, we come together, we have a goal, we reward ourselves for the khayr and we build that brotherhood and we connect. You know what I'm saying? So as we're driving there, I just, I never knew there would be sharks around the bike. They're not a lot, by the way. They're very rare to find a shark. So I just asked, didn't it? I was shifting, I was like, she said, oh, curiosity, are there any sharks about? She goes to me sometimes. <laughs> I said, really? He saw my face, I got a bit stressed. He said, Imran, it's not even a shark that you have to worry about. The sharks are cool, they're not going to do anything to you. He said, there's three things in the sea that are dangerous. And he goes, I'm going to tell you an order of danger. He goes, there's jellyfish. They sting you, cause you a bit of discomfort. I was thinking, I could take a little jellyfish sting. I could take a sting, right? Hurts, this, that. No problem, I can affirm that. He said, then there's stingray. You know the stingray, which is the... I don't know how to describe it if you don't know what it is, but it's like a flat thing and it's got a fat tail. It's got a sting at the end. Most of them are not that big. But you know that guy that was a crocodile hunter, that one used to wrestle crocodiles? He got killed by one of them. That brother used to go fight crocodiles. And then a the stingray murked him. It literally, bang, shanked him in his heart. He died. And it's rare for that to happen. Because they're not really that big. But he was like, they can sting you. If a stingray, it's not going to be that deep. Unless it's a mad one, like the one that got him. 
But he was like, you know, the way it happens that when you snorkel, you go to the bottom of the ocean, right? Because sometimes they camouflage in the ocean, so you step and you don't realize why, you just stepped on a stingray. And then boom, it might sting you. But it's not that deep more often. I said, you know what, bro? I'm not going to the bottom of the ocean. I'm safe, inshallah. I'm safe, right? Then he goes to me. And this is what I heard. Wallahi, this is what I heard. He goes, there's the enemy. I said, the enemy? He goes, yeah, there's the enemy in the ocean. I said, shit, I'm not going to no enemy. You're telling me there's an enemy. I'm not going to no enemy in the ocean. He said, it's, it's, it's enemy. It's this black thing. It's on the rocks and sometimes it's, you know, on the bottom of the ocean. And he goes, this, if you step on it, it goes pain, suffering, or lie, agony. He said, that, that is the most dangerous thing in the ocean. So I started searching. I realized I got the name wrong. It wasn't enemy. It's called enemy, uh, enemy or something like that. Or another name is called sea urchins. But the way he said it, it sounded to me like enemy. It was these black things with spikes and pow. Well, I can't lie to you, that got me scared. Anyways, when we went into the ocean, at the end of it, yeah, he goes to me, Imran, Allah Barak, man, you were swimming in a swarm of jellyfish. How come you didn't panic? And by the way, just before we got there, he, I remember he looked at us, yeah, you had Tim Humble serious, because you know, he's, he, he, Allah Barak, he goes and does ruqya to jinns, and you know, sometimes it kills them, innit? So he's got that serious face, you know, he turns a serious face on. Serious. So he looked at us in the car before we got. I said, "By the way, don't panic. People don't drown except when they panic." But he looked at me the way he's talking. I'm thinking, "Bruv, what's 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 this enemy in the ocean?" Like? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? He said, "You know, you start panicking because then you're gonna drown." So at the end, he was like, "Man, you were in that. You were in the jellyfish, and you never panicked. Allah, my bad." I said, Wallahi, I didn't see no jellyfish. What are you talking about? <laughs> and by the way, I'm in the ocean. Imagine I'm in the ocean. I'm actually in the ocean. I got my God, I can see everything. And by the way, Allah, you know one thing I learned from fishes? Wallahi, they're not racist, they don't discriminate. One thing, one lesson I took from the fish, Wallahi, they're blessed, you know. When you roll, when you go in, suddenly they run away because of the disruption to the water. And then suddenly they all come back and it's like you join, they swim right next to you in their little group. Wallahi, I was like, wow, you accepted me. <laughs> this, this flounder looking thing just accepted man just, just let's go we're family now <laughs> it was so nice so, like, so our crop fishes are not racist Allah and Barry so humans need to take that lesson from them but anyway I said Sheikh well, I was under the water I didn't see no jellyfish then I cropped you know why because the whole time there I was doing dhikr when he told me this enemy this <laughs> don't panic I'm swimming I'm just doing my dhikr well, I believe Allah blinded me from being able to see that jellyfish because well, if I saw that he said, you were in a swarm. Wallah, I would have just been gone. I would have just taken my shahad. I would have said, this is it now. <laughs> then we go to the bottom and just become one with the enemy or something. <laughs> but honestly, Wallah, I can't lie, man. Dubai is, that, you know, it's, it being in any Muslim country is beautiful. Like, all Muslim countries have got problems, unfortunately. But like, it's a mess and everything, and whatnot, and so forth. I think it would be great if we all went on a nice trip together, inshallah. You know, we can go scuba diving, we can go... You know in Dubai there's, if you, it's a desert, yeah, but if you want to go skiing, they've got a ski slope, a ski slope. It's inside, the, it's like snow, it's proper, like, it's like you're in the Alps. You could do all that stuff there, halal, fun. And it would be good to build a brotherhood. But I won't allow anyone to come unless they're consistent in the classes. If you don't come because of a reason, I understand. But you've got to be consistent. Does that make sense? Inshallah. Anyways, bidna lai ta'ala let's start. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'ad. We're going to start at tayammum. At tayammum is something for tahara, right? It's in the chapter of tahara. You need to be able to do tahara to pray salah. And we said the asal, the foundation of how you do tahara is what? Through wudu and ghusl. If you're in a major state of ritual impurity, you do ghusl. If you're in a minor state of ritual impurity, you do you do wudu. But if I don't have water, what do I do now? You do temple. Exactly. Beautiful. Allah mabarik. MashaAllah. If you don't have water, you now do? at tayammum Good. So, this is why sometimes you're going to... And by the way, it's not just when you don't have water. Sometimes water could be there, but you can't use it because you're... You're sick. You're sick. You might have a wound. You put that water in that wound. What's going to happen now? What's going to happen? It's going to get infected and you could die. 
It happened to a companion at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had a wound on his head and at night he entered into a state of major ritual impurity. He had a wet dream. So he came to the rest of the companions. He said, is there a way out for me? Like, do I have to do ghusl? Do I have to put water on my head? And the companion said, we don't know anything except for you have to put water on it. You have to wash yourself with water. His wound became even worse and he died because of that. When the Prophet found out, he became so angry. He said, they killed him. May Allah kill them. Pay attention. Giving a fatwa without knowledge can result in a person's death. This is the danger of about speaking without knowledge. To speak, nowadays we're so quick to give a fatwa with regards to a man's business. Is it halal haram? You told him it's haram. Now he's broke, he's in the streets because he doesn't have any money to eat now. And it actually was halal, you didn't even realize because you didn't know the difference between this and that. You, is me, um, me and my wife, are, they, are we divorced? Because I said this to her. He said, yeah, I can't lie, I think you're divorced. But you're actually still married. Now she married another man. So she's fornicating with him and you're still married to her. Don't give fatwas based on what? Ignorance. You don't know. You don't know. Does that make sense? Some of the Salaf would say that on the day judgment, if, if I give someone an answer to a question, my hands are going to be shackled and I'm going to be brought before Allah. And Allah's going to say to me, where did you get this from? And he said, I'm going to say, Allah, I got it from Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So the shackles are going to be put on Ahmad ibn Hanbal. The shackles are important to Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And he's going to say, Ahmad, where did you get this from? And he's going to say, oh, I got it from Sufyan al-Thawri. And the shackles are going to put on Sufyan al-Thawri. He's going to say, where did you get it from? And he said, oh, I got it from the one above me. And then the shackles are going to put on him, where did you get it? He said, oh, I got it from the Prophet's companion, Abdullah ibn Umar. And then the shackles are put on the Prophet's companion, where did you get it from? And he's going to say, oh, I got it from your messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, then we're all going to be free. If you speak about Allah without knowledge, ittaqillah. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't play that game, wallahi. Especially when it can kill. Then the Prophet said, what? They killed him. May Allah kill them. Then he said, why didn't they ask? For asking is the cure to ignorance. Asking is the cure to ignorance. That is, do you need a cure for diseases? That means ignorance is a disease now. As in there's a disease in us. Jahl. Ignorance is a disease. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying that the cure for that disease is... Asking, seeking knowledge, question, knowledge, ilm. Does that make sense? So, that's just a fa'idah. That's just a fa'idah with regards to at-tayammum, the importance of knowledge and whatnot. Because you can use, you can do tayammum when you either don't have water or you don't have the ability to use water, like that companion. Another narration mentioned that he could have done tayammum. That was the point. So anyway, what does the word at-tayammum mean? In the Arabic language, the word tayammum means intention. Qas. It means intention. Why? Because you're intending the dirt. You're intending the earth. You're intending the turab, which is the... I'll explain what turab is in a second, but we're just going to use the Arabic word for now. But the earth has something called turab on it. I'll explain what the word means. But the earth has something called turab. You're intending that. You're not intending water here. You're intending the, the earth. You're intending the earth. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Istilahan, technically speaking, it's Isar Turab al Tahur ila wajhi wal yadayni bi niyatil maqsusa. Technically, what it means is that you take what? You take the Turab, you take the this thing on the earth, you intend it, and you bring it to your face, and you bring it to your hands with a specific intention. With a specific intention. That's what it means, okay? In this section, inshallah ta'ala, you're going to learn five things. You're going to learn, learn the reasons for being able to do tayammum. The second thing you're going to learn is the conditions for doing tayammum. The third thing you're going to learn is the obligatory elements of tayammum. The fourth thing you're going to learn is the voluntary sunan elements of tayammum. And the last thing you're going to learn is the things that nullify your tayammum. So these five things, and you can say you have a good understanding of the overview of a tayammum. By the way, let me not fool you. It's going to sound very simple when we go through it today. This is a very complicated chapter in fiqh. And it's not complicated, but it's long. So we come to the next book, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to tell you really what Tiamum is about. If you're still here. After Dubai. Inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> so the reasons for doing Tiamum is al-ajz anil ma. Is when you're not allowed to, when you don't have the ability to use water. And when you don't have the ability to use water, it's either one of two. Either because there's no water present. Even though the, if there's no water present. Or if you don't have the ability to use the water. Because what? You're sick. Okay, pay attention. Let's just say that there is water present. 
but it belongs to someone else. He owns the water. And he's not giving me permission to use his water. That is as if there's no water present. That's as if there's no water present. Right? Because there's no water present for you to use. That's the point. There cannot be any water present for you to use. The second thing is that the water's present. There's water there. I can't open my tap and water will come out. But I'm sick. I don't have the ability to use the water. I'm sick. I don't have the ability to use the water. Pay attention. I'm going to give you a benefit here with regards to being sick now. With regards to being sick. Because it's not just water you don't have to use when you're sick. Or when the water would affect your sickness. It's only if the water will affect your sickness, yeah? If a person's sick, it's not just that you're sick that you can't use the water. But is this water going to affect your sickness? That's the question. Does that make sense? Okay, this, just doesn't, this doesn't just apply to water. It can apply to any sickness. For example, you have a broken leg. And because of it, you cannot stand in sabah. Because of it, you can now not stand in as-sabah. Because of your broken leg. Does that make sense? Or, for example, you have, you have a problem, let's just say, in your knee. And you can now not make sujood in sabah. Right? Or you have diabetes. And you need to what? Eat certain foods. And because of it, you cannot fast in Ramadan. As a general rule of thumb, is that if you're sick and the sickness is getting in the way of your ibadah, you don't have to do that particular ibadah or that part of the ibadah. Or that part of the ibadah. Like if you can't stand, you sit in salah, right? Okay, so what does it mean to be sick? Number one, if by doing that ibadah, it will make your sickness worse. For example, you use the water, it's going to make your sickness worse. I'm going to give you the bullet points of how to measure whether you qualify for saying, I don't, I don't have to do this. The first thing is, by doing that act of worship, will it make your sickness worse? By using the water, will it make your sickness worse? By doing sujood and you've got a broken knee, will it make your sickness worse? That's the first thing. The second thing is, will it make your recovery delayed? If your recovery gets delayed, then you don't have to do it. The third thing is, what? If there is a risk of death, it can be fatal. The fourth thing is that it will cause you excruciating pain. Pain is of levels. There's a pain which is discomfort, but you can handle it. Then there's pain which is, this is, this is outside just discomfort, this hurts. I'm in pain. I'm in excruci- I'm in serious pain. There's a pain where I can firm it, no problem. It's a bit uncomfortable, but I can firm it. Then there's a pain which is what? I can, this is, this is dark. I can't do this. I'm really in pain. I'm ex- in excruciating pain. Any of these situations, any of these situations is what? It qualifies you to not have to do it. This is called al ajs inability. You don't have the ability if number one, your sickness is going to get worse by doing it. If number two, your recovery will be delayed. Number three, there's a risk of your life. Number four, there's going to be pain which is outside the norm. Pay attention. This is one of those things where the mufti can't tell you. You have to fear Allah. The mufti can say to you, listen, if you're in excruciating pain, you don't have to stand. You can sit in your salah. But you are the only one that knows if you're really in excruciating pain. Allah said, بَلِ insan ala nafsihi basira. The human being knows himself. The mufti, the, the mufti can tell you, you don't have to fast because if, you're, if, you're, if it's going to affect you for not eating for these hours. But only you really know if it's going to affect you. Does that make sense? Okay, pay attention. Let's say you don't know yourself, but you get a doctor. Okay, the doctor, if he's trustworthy, if he's mawthuqun bihi, if he's trustworthy, you can take the doctor's word. Or if it's a female doctor as well, it doesn't matter. It could be a male doctor or a female doctor, and they're trustworthy, they tell you, you can take it. But you should go to a Muslim doctor. Because a Muslim doctor will give you a different view to a Catholic doctor. Because a Catholic, they just will tell you, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. A Muslim doctor understands there's a religion here. He's a practicing Muslim doctor. He'll tell you there's deen here. He understands salah. This is the first thing you're going to be asked about in the day of judgment. 
Does that make sense? You can say, look, it's going to maybe be a little bit, but it's not really going to cause you that real trouble. The NHS doctor is just going to tell you, no problem, just don't do it. But the Muslim is going to tell you, yeah. And, he, and by the way, a Muslim doctor who's practicing, who knows the deed, not a jahil one, but who knows the deed, who understands the deed, he's going to tell you what? I'll be honest with you, sit this one out. This, this can be problematic for you. This can be problematic for you. Does that make sense? Or you listen to the fatwa of the scholars who have spoken to doctors. Like, you know, when it came to certain fatwa, medical fatwa, Ibn Uthaymin would sit with 200 doctors and he would just ask them. They would make sure they explain the mas'ala to him. With 200 doctors, experts. And then we say, okay, this is halal or this is haram. Does that make sense? So these are the rulings when it comes to al-ajj. So then to summarize, you can do tahara, you can leave off tahara with water if you don't have the ability to use water. And that breaks up into two. Either because the water is not present for you to use, or because what? It's present, but you're not able to use it because you're sick. And what, and what qualifies you to be unable due to sickness? We mentioned these four things. Either it will make the sickness worse, it will delay the recovery, it can risk your rise, life can be at risk, or excruciating pain. And that doesn't just apply to water, but anything that Allah wants you to do, you can't do because of these reasons, it's now been uplifted from you. Does that make sense? In Bab al from the angle of benefit, some acts of worship, if you don't have the ability to do, they get uplifted from you completely. I can't, I can't, what? Fast? That's it, it's uplifted from me now. It's not like fast half the day and don't fast the other half. Does that make sense? You can't use water or make you sick? Don't use the water, no problem, inshallah ta'ala. Does that make sense? Salah? You can't stand? Sit. You can't sit? Lie down. You can't even move while you're lying down? Pray with your finger. You can't move your finger? Pray with your eyes. You can't open your eyes and close them, you're that sick. You manifest the pillars of the salah in your heart. You pray in your heart. There's not a single point while you are conscious, no matter how sick you are, where the salah becomes uplifted from you. No matter how sick you are, that you must do till your last final breath before you meet Allah, before the angel of death comes and takes your soul. Is that clear, brothers? Yeah? Good. That's the first point. The reasons for being allowed to do tamam. The second point is the conditions. The conditions, remember the things that come before the act, right? The first condition is that you must use a turab. What is turab? What is, what is turab? Turab, so remember there's earth, right? Let, let's just say you go to the sand, the desert. Or let's say you go to what? Where there's mud, where there's soil. Earth. Not plastic, not wood. You go to the actual earth on the ground, the natural earth. It always has a layer of residue on top of it. If I come to the soil and I put my hand on the soil, what happens? What happens? I lift my hand up, what's going to happen? What's going to be on my hand? It's going to be residue. There's going to be residue. If I, find, if I go outside, there's, there's, there's mud, there's rocks on the earth. If I touch it, it's going to be like a dusty, a dusty residue on the natural part of the earth. Not the, not the unnatural part. On the natural part of the earth, there's going to be a dusty-like residue. That is what you do tayammum with. Is that clear? That is what you do tayammum with. So you don't have to scoop the earth in your hand, soil, and rub it on your face. You don't go and, you know, that sand is not exfoliated for your face and you start rubbing it into your... No. You literally just put your hand on the earth. And what do you do? I'll tell you what to do, but the point is that the point I want you to understand is is that you use the part of the earth that has ghubar. Ghubar is called residue. Ghubar is it has it has the dusty, the dusty kind of thing. I'm not saying it's dust. Dust gathers on wood, on plastic. I'm talking about the earth. The earth, the first top layer is what? Is kind of dusty. That ghubar, that is that is the part of the turab that you use. The whole earth, all of that is turab. But the part of it you use is what? That top layer. Is the what? That top layer. And of course it has to be pure. It has to be pure. There can't be feces in it. You know, because some people they put what? They put cow manure. They put cow feces on certain soil so that what? 
plants can grow. You don't want to accidentally touch feces, right? As in you don't know if it's pure? Then the default is it's pure. The default of the soil and the water is pure, right? Because the, Allah said that we sent down from the sky, and tahura, pure water. So the default of water is pure. And as for the earth, the Prophet sallallahu said, wa tahura, that the earth was made for me, a place of prayer and pure. So the default of the earth is pure. If you don't know, don't worry. Only when you're certain that it's impure, you stay away from it. But if you go outside and you find water and you find soil, it's all pure. That's the default. That's the default. So that's, this turab has to be pure, it has to be, it has to be khalis. It can't be mixed with anything. It can't be mixed with flour. It can't be mixed with chili powder. All right? It, it just has to be what? Pure earth. Does that make sense? And it has to be غير مستعمل. Someone else couldn't have used it. Same way we said water. If someone else used the water and then it drips off him, can you do with that water? No. Same with the, the, the soil that a person puts, they use for termum. You don't do what? You don't do what? You don't use his, as in he's got it on his face. You say, wait one second, let me take it on his face. And then wipe it myself. You can't do that. Because it's been used. So that's the first condition. That you have to use turab. And I said the turab that you use is the top part. Which has the ghubar, which has the dusty element. And it has these three conditions. The turab has three conditions. It has to be pure. It has to be not mixed with anything. And it cannot have been used by someone before you. Beautiful. This, yes. So you said you cannot use the... No problem. Yes, beautiful. So we're not talking about not being able to do tayammum from the same place a person did tayammum. We're talking about the same thing that came onto his hand that he put into his face. So you come to the, the earth, you place your hand on it. What you got is what you do tayammum with. Does that make sense? What you got is what you do. That what's on your hand, another man can't use. Okay, good. The second condition. Second, sorry? As in, you can't use that for tiamum now. Flower. Anything other than the earth. Anything other than... So, okay. So, when we say it cannot be mixed, we mean it cannot be mixed with anything other than soil. Yeah. Earth. It's no problem if there's stones. No problem. If that's earth. It's natural earth. If it's natural earth, fine. But now I've added flour to it. Now I've added chili powder to it. Does that make sense? Now I added a couple of things. That's all problematic now. Just if it's on its natural essence, whatever is naturally there in the earth, no problem. There's grass coming out of the earth, no problem. No problem. No problem. There's a snake that's moving through the earth, no problem. It's all natural. It's, does it make sense? Yeah, I was going to say, like, what if it's raining? Ah, next book. Next book. Next book, inshallah, Dad. If it's raining, you don't need Tim. You, you just go to what you do with all, right? <laughs> but it, what if the Torah is wet? Yeah. That will come to you, inshallah. That will come to you. I told you to end this one. This, this one goes deep. The second thing is, I'll come to you, okay, just because I want to get through this quickly. I don't want sisters who are in the class to go too late. But the class, by the way, because the Isha time is going to be early now from next week, the class will not finish this late because the Isha is going to be 6.30. That's why we started late because I was like, if we start at 6.30 today, the Salah time is going to break. So we might as well just start after Salah. But from next week, the class will be done by 8.30 latest, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, the second condition is Dukhul Waqt. The time has to enter. The time has to enter for the Salah. Does that make sense? The same way we said the guy who's doing wudu, but he keeps breaking his wudu, he's allowed to do wudu and pray, right? He's allowed to do wudu and pray, right? But he cannot do wudu before the time of the salah. And for every salah he has to do a new wudu. Why? Because it's out of necessity. When it's necessity, you can't take advantage. You have to do it every time. Does that make sense? So same way with tayammum now. He doesn't have water. He can only do one salah with it. He can only do one salah with that tayammum. Does that make sense? He can only do one salah with that tiyamun. And he can't do the tiyamun until the time enters. Why? If he does tiyamun before the salah time enters, he may find water. When? When the salah time came in. Does that make sense? So he waits for the salah time to enter. He waits for the salah time to enter. And then after the salah time has entered, he then does the tiyamun. Does that make sense? He then does the tiyamun. And for every salah, he does a new tiyamun. What's the evidence for this? The fact that in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah said, Ya ayyuhu al-ladhina amanu, idha qumtu min al-salah, faqsiru wujuhakum aidakum ila marafiq, wamsuhu bi ru'usikum arjulakum ila al-ka'bin. Allah said, when you stand for the salah, anytime you stand for the salah, do wudu. 
This shows that every salah you have to do, wudu for it. It shows every salah you have to do, wudu for it. Yes or no? If you stand for the salah, do wudu. Okay? Okay. Now Allah said, if you don't find water, فَتَيَمَّمُ سَعِيدٌ طَيِّبًا Then do tayammum. So we were told that every time we stand for salah, do wudu. And if we couldn't find water, we do tayammum. And that is in the context of every salah. Right? Every salah. Okay, good. So every time we stand for salah, we use water to do wudu. And if you can't find the water, every time you stand for salah, you do tayammum. Okay. But can you do one prayer with many one many prayers with one wudu? Can you do that? Can you pray Dhuhr Asr Maghrib with one wudu? Because we have an evidence. On the day when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, he prayed all of the prayers of that day with one wudu. And then Umar asked him, and the Prophet said, I did that intentionally. So now we have an evidence that shows us that not every prayer do you have to do wudu for. But we don't have an evidence that takes the tayammum out of that. Does that make sense? So the tayammum remains upon the original essence, which is every salah where you don't have water, you do tayammum. Okay, next salah comes in, you do it again. Next salah, you do it again. So if you have tayammum, you can only pray one prayer with it. You can't pray two, you can't pray three. You can only pray that one prayer, and then you wait for the next salah. You're going to ask me about similar prayers. Right? If there's no water, he does tayammum again. Okay, the question you're going to ask about sunnah prayers. Sunnah prayer is the exception. You, you can only pray one fard, salah, with one tayammum. But the sunnah prayers, you can pray many. You can pray many. For example, you can pray your one dhar, which is fard, and then you keep praying as many sunnah prayers as you want if you want to. But when asr time kicks in, tayammum again. If you don't find water. Okay, good. The third condition is what? That you do tayammum for every salah individually. How is that different to the first one? I just explained the first. Sorry, how is that different to the one we just mentioned, the second one? I just went into a bit more detail with the second one. The second one is, they wait for the time to enter. The third one is, and then when the next salah comes, you do it again. Right? So how many kids should we take so far? Number one, you do it with turab. You can't do it with what? Plastic. You can't do it with what? Wood. You have to use the earth. Secondly, you have to wait for the salah time to enter. Thirdly, when you want to do it again for the next salah, you have to what? Do it for that salah every time. Every time. Does that make sense? The fourth condition is, you have to search for water. You have to look for water. What's the evidence? Is? Allah said, tajidu ma'an. Allah said, if you don't find water, That means you have to look for it. You can't say, I never found it if you never looked for it. Right? No, you never looked for it. It could have been right there. Does that make sense? You can, you can only say, I didn't find my keys when you, didn't look, when you looked for them. You can only say, I didn't find that five pound note when you, didn't, when, you, when you looked for it and you couldn't find it. But if you didn't even look in the first place, can you say, I didn't find it? No. So then, you have to look for water. You have to look for water. Does that make sense? If you look for it, you can't find it. You put the effort in. Now you've qualified. When it comes to searching for water, we said you have to search for water. It's a condition, right? But it's only for the one who doesn't have water. If the person's sick, he doesn't have to search for water. Because even if water is there, he wouldn't be able to use it. So the condition of searching for water is only for the one who can't find it. Because Allah said, فَإِلَّمْ تَجِدُوا مَا If you don't find water, do tayammum. This is what? Not talking about the one who doesn't have the ability to do it because he's sick. This is talking about the one who has the ability but he can't find water. Is that clear? Yes? Yes. Um, there was one time they were praying like, Janata, right? so I saw some people who started doing tayammum quickly, they just joined it because it 
the water is available but it's far away no oh, they have to go you have, have to, to go yeah. Jesus yeah but the sun is about it if they have if they if the time was there the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said uh, Allah does not accept the salah of any one of you until he does wudu. Now out of necessity, out of necessity what? I can go what? But I don't have water, I can do tiyamun. But it's there. And plus the salah al-janaz is fard kifaya. It's not fard al-ayn. Does that make sense? Wallahu alam. The fifth condition is that when you go and get the when you go to the earth to get that dusty element, which is called the ghubar, you go to it twice. Once for the face, second time for your hands to your elbows. Once for the face, second time from your hand to your elbows. You don't go and do it one time. It's darbatan. Once, face. Come back to it second time, hands to the elbows. So it has to be twice you have to go to the Torah. Does that make sense? The sixth condition is that you have to actually intend grabbing that soil or the residue on the soil. You have to intend tiyamum with it. If a person just grabs it for kicks and says, you know what, I might as well do tiyamum. He can't. He has to actually have an intention at the time he puts his hand on the earth. That's the sixth what? Sixth condition. Is that clear? Um, when you go to earth twice, isn't that why on the earth? Why is the condition on that twice? Second story? When you go to earth twice. Shalitanun, you've got to go to it twice. Is that true in that? You know what it is? So sometimes the fuqaha, when they talk about conditions, they bring pillars into it. And then they mention them again later. And this happens a lot in Tiamu. Even when you come to Kitab Matan al he mentions pillars and conditions together. So it's, they're a bit relaxed with it when it comes to these things. Just, just understand the point. Um, so I haven't like mentioned an order. I'm just, these are conditions. What, oh, we'll come to that. We haven't come to that yet. That's actually doing it. These are just conditions, things that need to be in place before you do the actual act. Okay, now we come to the third point, which is the pillars of tayammum. What do I actually do? The actually obligations, okay? And you do five things. The first thing is naql turab. You actually take the turab, which is the residue on the soil, and you what? You transfer it from the soil to where? To your face. That's the first thing, okay? The second thing is that you have an intention at the time. You do that, and what? That intention is, what's the intention? Very important point here. It's istibaha. Istibaha to salah. It's for the salah to become permissible for you. This is different to the intention for wudu and ghusl. What was the intention for wudu and ghusl? To uplift impurity, to do tahara. This, the intention here is not tahara. You are still in a state of impurity if you do tayammum. But it's just that the salah is permissible for you to pray. Right? That's why there's a book that the Shafi'iyah yeah, they have. You know, Shafi'iyah yeah, they write they write riddles when it comes to fiqh. And they mention, you know, because the Shafi'iyah say a person who's in a state of major ritual impurity cannot read Quran, cannot touch the Mus'haf, and they cannot stay in the masjid. So Imam Nawi rahmallahi presented a riddle. He said, Indana, we have a junub, a person who is in a state of major ritual impurity, right? Yet yeah, he's allowed to recite Quran, stay in the masjid, and touch the mushaf. And he's allowed to pray. And he's in a state of major ritual impurity. What does he mean by this? He's one who's mutayammim. He's the one who found, he did tayammim because he didn't have water or he couldn't use the water. Does that make sense? This is very important. And by the way, this is the reason why, one of the reasons why the Shafi'i, yeah, they say, Every salah you do a new wudu. Sorry, you do a new tayam for every salah. For, you know why? Because wudu, it stays until the next salah. Because I'm in a state of tahara. So my tahara stays. You're not in tahara in the first place. Tayammum is what? It's not, it's not tahara. It's not a bedal. It's not an exchange. Even Ibn Taymiyyah did take the view that it was an exchange for tahara. And he argues it. And he argues it strong. But wallahu a'lam, it seems that the best and strongest view is that it's not. Because Ibn Umar was a companion of the Prophet 
he used to, if he did tayammum, every salah do a fresh tayammum. And he, would, and he would say that. Does that make sense? And Imam Al-Bayhaqi brings that narration in Sunan Al-Kubra. He says, this is the most authentic narration in this bab. And some of the scholars, this ijma' sukuti, that there is a consensus on this. Because none of the companions opposed him in it. So for every salah, you must do a new tayammum. One of the reasons is, the evidence we mentioned in the verse, but also because you're not in a state of tahara. That's why when you're intending, you're not intending tahara. You're not intending raf'ul hadith, uplifting major or minor impurity. You're intending istibahatul salah. You're intending the salah to be permissible for you. Yes, akhi. Pardon, sir? If someone's allergic to soil, you're going to learn, inshallah, what to, what to do. When you study al-qa'id al-fiqhiyah, we study darura, inshallah, ta'ala. we study necessity. We'll come to it, inshallah. Ta'ala. Are you allergic to it? Yeah. Okay, good, good. <laughs> You're going to learn about a person who prays out of necessity. We might talk about this tomorrow when we talk about the menses. When we talk about menses, we might, we, might, we might talk about it there. A person who what? Afwan, let me answer it now. A person who doesn't find water and he doesn't find soil, what does he do? He prays out of necessity. Right? He prays out of necessity. He's got soil there, but it's impure. He's got soil there, but it's mixed. So what does he do now? Out of darur, out of necessity, what does he do? He prays. Does he bring the salah back though? Later on, when he does find water? We'll come to it. We'll come to it. We'll come to it, inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> okay, so the first thing is naqru turab, to take the turab from the earth, the, 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 the earth, the, the residue part, the, the, the dusty part, and to transfer it, to, to take it, put it on your hand, and bring it to your face. And as you're doing this, you have an intention. You have an intention at the time you do this, and the intention is what? You're making salah, that the, the salah is going to be permissible for you. Istibahatu salah. The third thing that you do is mashu jami al waj is that you do what? You take the, the, the residue of, of the soil and you wipe, not wash. Remember we discussed the differences between wiping and washing and rubbing and sprinkling? We said there's delk, nab, mas and ghasr. This is mas, wiping. Allah said, وَمْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ Afwan, naam, وَمْسَحُوا بِوُجُوهِكُمْ وَمْسَحُوا بِوُجُوهِكُمْ وَأَيْدِيكُمْ مِنْ وَأَيْدِيكُمْ مِنْ Allah said, and wipe your faces. Some brothers will lie, they do this, they take the sand, they start washing their faces again. Does that make sense? You know, you're just wiping. Does that make sense? Pay attention. If a person has a thick beard, the water goes on the outside of the beard, right? If he's got a thin beard, it has to go what? Inside. What if he's doing tiyamun? Does the, does the dirt have to go inside? The earth? No. Relax, brother. Take it easy. The point here is not to get dusty. The point is not to get dusty. It's not to get dusty. Does that make sense? You're just doing an act of worship that's going to allow the salah to become permissible for you. So what do you do? You just wipe the entirety of your face. Does that make sense? Just wipe the entirety of your face. How many times do you? Once. Just once. But I want to do it a second time. No, don't do it. But please, I want to. No, don't do it that, brother, please. Stick to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Does that make sense? Yes. It's going to say I'm making sure you, but I'm not permissible. Yeah. Tell permissible for major impurity, major state of impurity, or minor state of impurity. No problem. As long as you don't find water. I said at the beginning, the companion, the one who died because he had, he did, he had a wet dream. He was in a state of major ritual impurity. Yes. Uh, how is it? How do you get the earth and wipe on your face? Yes. How does it do the transfer? No, the first one is the transfer from the earth onto your hand. Okay, okay. Does that make sense? And you're bringing it to your face with the intention. Bang! All of that, same time. When you put it, when you put the, uh, you have to just have the intention there. Does that make sense? Okay. The fourth thing is مسح اليدين مع المرفقين. Is that what you do? You wipe your hand up to your elbow. Right? Let me demonstrate. So you have. You can all hear me, right? 
Yes? So you have what? You have the you have the turab in your hands. Right? So obviously I'm starting my right first, but okay, let me just demonstrate my right hand. Okay. So it's here. Does that make sense? So what do you do? You bring it all the way down one time. I'm showing you because some brothers have worse. Okay? So you have to show them. Otherwise they're gonna start dipping their hand into the soil. <laughs> so what you do is you start, you bring it all the all the way down, you're wiping. Wiping, get to the elbow, get to the elbow, turn, and what do you do? All the way back up. Simple. You see that? You see that? That wasn't that hard, was it? That's some brothers get what's worse. Pay attention. For each one time you do that, when you, when you go to the earth and you bring it to your face, you tap the earth once. The second time, you tap the earth again. So you don't do this, face, and then go to your hands. No. Tap the earth, face. Tap the earth, hands to the elbow, other hand to the elbow. And by the way, how do you do it? You take your hands, tap, tap the earth. Do you beat the earth? Do you punch the earth? No, you just place your hands on the earth. Tap it. Solid. Touch the earth so that you got some on your hand. Yes? And then you bring it to your face. Done. Look how simple that was. Tap the earth again. Up here. You see, you see how easy that was? You see how easy that was? That's your tail, mum. The fifth thing is that you must do it in that order. Yeah, you have a question? Second story? Good. So let me repeat all of them quickly. The first thing that you do is that you transfer the earth from the as in, as in you put your hand on the earth. You transfer you do the first tap. Okay? And this you're gonna transfer the earth from here to your face. That's the first thing. Second thing is you have an intention. For you to be able to pray, pray the salah, not for tahara. The third thing that you do is what? You wipe the face. The fourth thing that you do is you wipe the hands to the elbows. The fifth thing is, make sure you do it in that order. And for every wipe, I eat hands. Wa alaikum salam. First time you wipe the face, second time you wipe the hands to the elbow. Each time, it's its own tap on the earth. It's just, you hit the earth separately each time. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Straightforward, right? Say that again. It doesn't have to be, no. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be, no. No. Yes. Second story? Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. You can do it here. You can go over and do it there. You can do it here. You can do it from here. You can do it from here. You can go all the way over there if you want to. Does that make sense? Okay, this is how you do Tiyam. Pay attention. There's a hadith in Al-Bukhari and Muslim in which the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed or allowed a companion to do tayammum only washing, only sorry, wiping up to his hands. But in the madhab of Imam Shafi'i, what do they do? They do from the hands to the elbows. What's the evidence that the Shafi'i they use? There's a hadith from Ibn Umar, but it's weak. So are they using a weak hadith? No. Is they done qiyas? They done an analogy. They said when you do wudu, what do you do in your wudu? You, you wash your hands to what? Your elbow. So they said because of that, we're going to do qiyas, we're going to do analogy based on that. And are you allowed to do analogy when there's no delil? Yeah, of course you are. When there's no, when there's no evidence, you can, you can do an analogy. As long as it's in line with the, the, you know, the principles of qiyas and whatever have you, right? Okay, good. But there's a hadith. So what happens now? That hadith Imam al-Shafi'i never found it authentic. There was the hadith of al-Bukhari a Muslim. Yes, but the chain that al-Bukhari a Muslim used was not the same chain that al-Shafi'i saw in his life. In fact, there's a statement by Imam al-Shafi'i. He said, in sahha, it is hadith is authentic. 
قلت لي I would have said it I would have said only do up to your hands does that make sense only do up to your hands only do up to your hands but he said it's not authentic and the Bukhari and Muslim didn't exist at his time they came after him does that make sense so the hadith is sahih it's in Al-Bukhari Muslim Al-Shafi'i never saw it in his life and this is one of the reasons why scholars may go against the Dalil not because they like to go against the Dalil stuff but they never saw the hadith authentic does that make sense that's just the benefit of mentioning. And some of the scholars within the Madhab said this. If I'm not mistaken, it was Imam Al-Rafi'i who said you don't have to go up to your elbows. Or it was Imam al nawi You don't have to go up to your elbows. They chose that you could just do it up to your hands. So then tayammum is even more simple now, right? Intention. Grab the earth. Intention. Grab the earth in one. Intention. Now, as you're doing this, wipe the face. Go to the earth again. Wipe the hands. And the back of the hand. That's it. Simple. Done. Tayammum. Done. Does that make sense? No. Second story? It's a hadith. The Prophet said clearly. He said, you tap the earth. You touch the earth. Okay, the fourth thing about Tayammum is the Sunan. The things that are recommended. Let me just go through this quickly. The things that are recommended we're going to mention are four. The first thing is what? Takhfif al ghubar You break, break if, 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 the, if the dirt, if, if, if when you touch it, when you bring it in your hand, it's like solid, it's like lumpy, clumpy. You break it up in your hand. You break it up in your hand. You crush it. Does that make sense? The second thing is muala. To when you do it, do it consecutively. Do the hands. Sorry, do the face and then do the hands right after. If you have a gap of like fifteen minutes, is that a problem? No, it's not because that's not a condition. That's not a, that's not a pillar. Consecutiveness is not a pillar, but it's a recommendation. Like with wudu, you can break up the things in the wudu, but consecutiveness is what is a is a sunnah. Okay, the third thing is what? That when you touch the earth, you spread your fingers. You, when you touch the earth, you spread your fingers. Does that make sense? The fifth thing, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, the fourth thing, the fourth thing, right? I said four, right? Is a general principle that I'm going to give you, which is that generally speaking, any sunnah, any sunnah which is a sunnah of wudu, that you can do for tayammum, you can do it as a sunnah for tayammum. For example, starting with your right and then your left. Is that sunnah of wudu? I can bring it to tayammum. What about saying the basmala? Is that sunnah? Yeah, that's it. Now I can bring it. What about what? Doing the siwak? What about cleaning, brushing my teeth, cleaning my teeth before I do wudu? Is that sunnah? So I can do that as a sunnah before I do tayammum. Does that make sense? The, but there are some sunnah that you can't do. For example, put the, you can put the water in your nose, but can you put the dirt in your nose? The, the, sorry, can you put the soil in your nose? Not dirt, can you put the soil in your nose? No, you can't. Can you put the soil in your mouth and rinse it? No, so then what we say these are sunnah that are not possible. If there's a sunnah that's possible with wudu, then it's also sunnah for tiyamun. There's an exception. A tithlif. Well, we have a good relationship with Majid. You see how our mind just... You see, how, you see the synchrony here? <laughs> I love it. Tithlif, which is... Repeating each action three times. It's a sunnah for wudu. It's possible to do it for tiyamun, but it's not a sunnah for tiyamun. Don't do it for tiyamun. Don't oppose the sunnah. Okay? The last thing, inshallah ta'ala, and then we're ending the lesson, which is the fifth point. The things that nullify your tiyamun. The things that break your tiyamun. Does that make sense? The first thing is anything that breaks your wudu breaks your tiyamun. What breaks your wudu? No, no, leave it to come around, please. Tafadda. Sorry, not come around, sorry, Willie. <laughs> so, because you're sitting next to each other. I know your names, don't worry. I know your names. <laughs> Go on, losing consciousness, good. Sisters, apparently they know the answer. Because last time when we ended the lesson, but the brothers didn't know, the sisters were like, why didn't they ask us? We knew. So I'm refreshing the page. Where's the answer, sisters? Where's the answer, sisters? It's on, right, Aman? What are the things that break your wudu?
Mm -hmm. And I want it without you looking at your notes. You guys are funny, man. This is why we ended the lesson last week. Today I'm in a bit of a better mood, so I'm not ending the lesson. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Number one, whatever exits the private parts. We've already got that one. Sisters, what's going on? Tfadl. Huh? Mm-mm. Man said insanity is wrong. No, it's not. That's something that falls under one of the things that breaks the rule. I want the four things. You're going to mention all four, yeah? Yes? Go ahead. Touching your private part. Touching your private part. Anything that comes out the front or the back. Good. Losing consciousness. Or, or losing your sanity or state of sanity. Yeah, good. Yeah, consciousness. Good. And last one? Touching a female. Does that make sense? Good. You see why it's really important because you see how these lessons are all connected. You see the reason why the scholars, they put these things in their orders because they're going to keep coming back to points from before. So the first thing that breaks your wudu, is, sorry, that breaks your tiamun, that nullifies your tiamun, is anything that was to nullify your wudu. The second thing is ar-ridda, apostasy. If a person leaves Islam, he becomes a kafir suddenly. He left, he broke, his tiamun has gone. He can become a kafir for many reasons. We need to study the kitab, Nawaqid al-Islam, the nullifies of al-Islam, that Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab authored. Because it goes through the things that nullify a person's Islam and they send them into kufr. Many things people don't even know. They can become a kafir for it. So if that happens, his tamam is gone. The third thing is, if he notices that there is water before he enters the prayer, Say that again, sorry? When it comes to Salah, we're going to come to that, inshallah. When it comes to Salah, we're going to come to that. Deep. We're going to come to that, inshallah. The question I'm asking is, uh, so the, the third point is that if you find water, if you find the water, a lot of the ahkam pertain to the time entering, leaving, the first thing in Salah is the whole waqt, the entering of the time. We'll discuss these rulings there, inshallah ta'ala. <coughs> and we're going to discuss some of them in the menses one. That's why I'm leaving it for there for next week, inshallah. Because women have that issue. She has come off her menses. Salah times even five minutes. What does she do? I'm going to talk about it there, inshallah. Okay, the fourth thing is what? So the third thing is, if you find water before you enter the Salah. Before you enter the Salah. Okay, now I have a question for you. At which point have you entered the Salah? You will pray, right? So which point do you enter the Salah? No, 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 Allah, I'm sorry. You can't answer this one, Sheikh. Aman, serious guy, you know. Allah, I'm bad. Aman, fiqh, and Aman. His name should be Aman fiqh. <laughs> Go on. When you say Allah Akbar. Is there anyone that disagrees? Put your hand up now if you disagree. <laughs> that you've entered it. Okay, you disagree. Really? So where does he enter Salah? But the intention is at the same time as the Allah Akbar, right? They're at the same time. So I have an intention right now, but I haven't done the takbir. Remember, remember we said intention has to be connected to the beginning of the action. Right? So the intention has to come with something. So I understand your point. It's basically both of you together. Okay, so you've got the intention, and you say, Allah Akbar, have you entered the Salah? Really? Okay, now let me throw a shubh at you. Is it the saying of the Allah Akbar or the raising of your hands? The saying. The raising of the hands is not the takbir. A lot of people think raising the hands is takbir. No, that's called raising the hands. <laughs> it's called Rafa al-Yadain. It's not takbir. The takbir is to say Allah Akbar. Okay, question. Now I'm going to throw you off. Which part of it? Is it when you say ah, Allahu Akbar at the Hamza? Ah. Or is it when you said Allah? Or is it when you said ah, Or is it when you say Akbar on the Ra? Huh? All of them? So from the beginning, when you say ah, Al. Huh? 
No, but what, so my point is, what is the point that I'm in Salah now? Huh? Uh, who thinks it's at the Hamza? On the Hamza, at the beginning of Allah. Who thinks it's the Ra at the end of Akbar? Put your hand up if you think it's the Hamza. Put your hand down if you, put your hand up if you think it's the Ra. Fuqaha. MashaAllah, Allah, 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 It's the Ra. Because you can't say you've done it until it's finished, right? So, Allahu Akbar. On the Ra, you've entered the Salah now. Come with the Salah now. Be, you're standing before Allah now. If you see the words Allahu Akbar, and the words, that's it. Go, go with your wudu, brother. Go with your wudu. Does that make sense? Go with your wudu, brother. Some brothers are like, what? Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Some people, they do something very bad. We should really discuss it when it comes to Salah, but I mention it now. When they say Allahu Akbar, they say Allahu Akbar. Why have you said Allahu Akbar? No. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar is not asking a question. That's different. Does that make sense? A lot of people when they do Adhan, they say Allahu Akbar, Allah. What are you doing, Akhi? It's Allahu Akbar. You can stretch it after, but not at the beginning, not on the Hamza. Does that make sense? Another mistake people when they make when they say so, when they do with the Adhan, they say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. They put a fatha on the end of the Ra. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. They say, have you heard that? It's Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. There's a dhamma on the Ra. Almost every masjid you go, that mistake happens. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It's not Allahu Akbar, Ra, Allahu Akbar. It's Allahu Akbar, Ru, Allahu Akbar. We're not in the book of Salah. We'll come to it, inshallah. Anyway, when you enter the Salah, it's based on the Ra, okay? So if you find water before you've said the Ra, what? The Atayamam is gone. The third thing is, إِذَا تَوَحْمَ وُجُودِ الْمَاءِ قَبْلِ الصَّلَاةِ If there is no reason to do Tayammum anymore. For example, the sickness is gone. Your sickness is gone. The reason why you're doing Tayammum is because you were sick. The reason is gone now. So now what you do? The Tayammum breaks. That's the end of our lesson. Sisters, if you have questions, please send your questions in now. And I'll take the brother's questions in the meantime, bi-idhnillah. Do you guys feel like you understand Tiamum? Do you guys feel like you under- understand Tiamum? <coughs> Who thinks they understand Tiamum now? Is it, is it clear though? Or is it a bit like, wait, is... Tiamum will be on his long. Tiamum is long, trust me. This is nothing. <laughs> And this is not even the most complicated chapter in fiqh. You know what the com- most complicated chapters of fiqh are? There's four. Chapter of menses. The chapter of the sujood of forgetfulness. Mm, this chapter is not a joke. Then there's what? The chapter of divorce. Stuff connected to women is always complicated. <laughs> Always. And the fourth one is what? No. Is tayammum? No, it's not zakah. Is tayammum? Sorry, it's not tayammum, sorry. Naam, afwan, tayammum, fourth one. Yeah, tayammum? Sujood the sahu? The sujood the forgetfulness? When to do it? Third one is what? The menses? And the fourth one is what? Huh? Talaq. There's a lot of Arabic grammar involved in that one. We'll come to the details of it, so don't worry, inshallah. Next lesson, you're gonna have a lot of fun. We talk about menses, trust me. The scholars, they said Allah tested women with the menses, because they have to go through it. And he tested the men with understanding it. (laughs) There's a type of woman, her period is so complicated, scholars called her al-mutahayyira, which means the one who's what? She's confusing. And they called her Al-Mutahayyara because she confused the scholars. The scholars said, what do I do with this? What do I do with this one right now? And wallahi, wallahi, when you read Imam al nawis Kitab Al-Majmu' and he comes to the issue of the woman who menses are complicated, wallahi, akhi, the calculations, the mathematics, 
والله يا ست مصوف والله I should have paid attention in school <laughs> but it's so funny because it's so complicated in the beginning books the scholars give it to you so simply it's like they don't even it's like they know oh, he's not going to get it when it comes to menses in Metanabi Shulia they don't even get it it's just one, two, three, boom and you're like what? that was easy come to the second book bro <laughs> come to the second third you'll see inshallah what it is <laughs>